and welcome to the September meeting of the Board of Regents. I'm going to do the roll call now. Regent Acker, Present. Regent Beam, Present. Regent Bernstein, Present. Regent Brown, Present. Regent Hubbard, Here. Regent Illich, Here. Regent Weiser, Regent, Regent White. Here. Today is our first meeting of the new academic year, and tomorrow is an important anniversary for our institution. The University of Michigan Flint will mark the 66th anniversary of the opening of its doors. It became the first of our two regional campuses and has served the students of Genesee County and our state since 1956. As it approaches its seventh decade, UM Flint is facing unprecedented challenges. Chancellor Duda has provided me and members of the board with the realities that he and his leadership team are facing. Enrollment is down 30% from the fall of 2014. Although we learned last week that numbers are up for new students, the overall enrollment trend is unsustainable. Six-year graduation rates are the lowest of the state's 15 public universities. More and more students from Flint, the Flint area are choosing to enroll elsewhere or not attend college at all. At the same, state, same time, our state is seeing an overall decline in the number of young people. We must make changes and they must be bold if UM Flint is to thrive. To that end, I have charged Chancellor Duda with developing a strategic plan for transforming UM Flint. The work begins tomorrow morning when he and I will host a town hall meeting with the campus community. The transformation plan will be inclusive and transparent. It will be driven by comprehensive data, including labor and student market demand for academic programs. It is critical that the Flint campus align its programs with the needs of our state's workforce. It is also critical to have stable leadership for this process, which again will be very inclusive and involve all in the community, which is why I have extended Chancellor Dutta's current appointment by two years to June 2026. This will allow him to complete a transformation plan and put it into action. I fully expect that work will be carried out with a financial investment from the university. I want to add that President-elect Ono is aware of the challenges that we face and fully supports this approach. Tomorrow's conversation is an important first step toward revitalizing the UM Flint campus that is strong both financially and academically. I will join the town hall meeting remotely and along with Chancellor Dutta, look forward to working together on this essential transformation. And at this point, I'd like to call on, on, on our Regent Brown. Thank you, President Coleman. Um, speaking uh, uh, in relations to this extension, I know there were some questions about the process that was used for the extension and the fact that it was not typical or ordinary. Uh, these are not typical or ordinary times. Um, uh, both the timing of the presidential transition and the, uh, the, the planned transformation for Flint. Uh, it was the president's judgment and all of the regents' uh, agreement that this extension be made now for both of those two reasons. Um, and it should demonstrate to the community the board's full support uh, of going through the process of the transition and especially in Chancellor Dutta. Thank you, Regent Brown. Here on the Ann Arbor campus, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Regent Hubbard. It's a very brief comment. I just want to say how much I support the effort here. I think it's important to have very bold transformation um, to get our campus in Flint on the right, back in the right mm -hmm. direction, and uh, really looking forward to this process going forward and how what it can bring to the campus. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Here on the Ann Arbor campus, we're looking to the future and the demands of student housing. Our residence hall system is vibrant, and we anticipate the need to build additional 
residential spaces in the upcoming years. We do not yet have specifics on locations, designs, or construction schedules, but we do know the following, that we want a future residence hall to honor a longtime campus leader. It's gonna be harsh. <laughs> Royster Harper served the university for more than 40 years, including 18 years as vice president of student life before she retired in 2019. She was an unrelenting champion of students and their experiences on campus. Among her many accomplishments was overseeing an extensive renovation and expansion of our residence hall system, including the construction of North Quad. This makes it my pleasure today to ask for the board's approval to name a future residence hall the Dr. E. Royster Harper Hall. It is an even greater pleasure to request this knowing that Royster is with us today, along with her husband, Charles. Royster, you are a dear friend, not only to me, but to so many others on campus. Please stand so that we can thank you. <laughs> Is there a motion to approve the naming of the so future moved. Harper Hall? Second. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Heck yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, Worcester didn't know about this. Uh, we did all sorts of deception to get her here. So that she came, <laughs> and Charles is a complete surprise. And I think Regent White would like to make a comment. Worcester. There clearly were no words to that we could express to appreciate you. This is a small step towards it. Um, you have been so critical to the board for so many years, and especially in the role of vice president for student life and how well you've helped us see the importance of listening to students and, and spending time understanding their concerns and, uh, Thank you so much for giving so much service to this institution. And it looks like Mark Bernstein wants to say something too. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I mean, Harper Hall is going to be a, uh, a, re a large residence hall on this, a much needed new residence hall on this campus. And I, I, I lived in Markley and I remember asking, who, who is Mary Markley? Who is Alice Lloyd? Who is, and mm -hmm. um, I just cannot uh, thank you enough for the service you've, uh, given this university and to countless students whose lives have been um, enriched by your work. And um, I'm just so, so honored that I'm able to vote on this today um, and, and, and honor you in this way. And we have, we, we stop Worcester because we've got Regent Illich here who wants to say something, so. I just want to say, um, obviously, I agree with all that's been said, but you are such a special person. And you ended up being a mentor to me in so many ways uh, because there's no BS with you. You say exactly how you feel, and you're honest with everybody, and your honesty really helped us be better leaders. Um, and I'm just so excited for you. It's going to be so awesome to have Harper Hall and think of you every day that we walk on campus. So we love you. We miss you. And this is our way of honoring you. So thank you for all of the service. And if I were at a hockey game, I'd have some kind of bullhorn or something. And I, could, <laughs> I could kind of blow, but yay. Appreciation not only for this honor, but for what the university did for me so many years ago. It changed the trajectory of my life. It does that countless young people.
that your leadership has just been incredible in this. And so I, I thank you um, on behalf of all the students for whom the work the university does makes an incredible difference in the lives of the people who lead and I am. <laughs> Thank you. This weekend, did are you are you saying something or? Yes. Uh, <laughs> just a moment. Yeah, but go to the go to the microphone. Okay. <laughs> This weekend is this weekend is homecoming, <laughs> uh, and we will welcome back thousands of alumni for reunions, dinners, and a football game. Few people on our campus have done more to embrace our graduates than Steve Grafton, longtime director of the Alumni Association. Steve's upcoming retirement after 28 years is bittersweet because it means saying goodbye to a devoted university citizen who is most deserving of a new adventure. I'm particularly proud of the Alumni Association's deep commitment to equity and inclusion and Steve's dedication in welcoming all. He was always focused on the future diversity of our student body. It was Steve who came forward with the idea of establishing the lead scholarships for deserving students who represent leadership, excellence, achievement, and diversity. For 15 years now, LEAD scholarships have helped provide a Michigan education to hundreds of Black, Latinx, and Native American students on all three of our campuses. This program is a powerful testament to Steve's vision, the generosity of donors, and the appeal of a Michigan education. Steve, thank you for the service even though you're not a graduate of the University of Michigan. <laughs> now, <laughs> Regent Brown. Yes, yes, Steve, will you join me at the podium? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The Alumni Association of the University of Michigan is an independent, very important, nonprofit organization that supports the university and is focused on the connecting of our 640,000 alumni around the world. Steve has been president of it for 28 years. You've led countless bowl trips and pep rallies. I've attended many of them. You provided the vision and leadership for founding and funding the expansion of the alumni building. You grew the Alumni Association's endowment from 12 million to 149 million. And maybe most importantly, you founded the LEAD Scholars Program, which helps highly qualified underrepresented students who embody leadership, excellent achievement in diversity and to pursue an education at the University of Michigan. To date, 600 students have benefited from this, your program. So thank you for your commitment and leadership to U of M. We wish you a long and relaxing retirement down on your farm. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. And from the Regents no Award. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, Thank you. I'm I'm humbled by this, and and I've I, I know that I'm going to have some opportunities in the next few days to say a few things, and and I I know I better write them down <laughs> because it'll be hard enough even if they're written. Um, but I want to say to President Coleman and the Regents, Executive Officers, friends, uh, how much you honor me today mm -hmm. by by these comments, um, and how grateful I am to be here on a day that Royster was honored in this way, my dear friend. I feel like Royster and mm -hmm. Cynthia and Lloyd and I grew up together here at Michigan. <laughs> we all started our last Michigan jobs at about the same time, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I love them, uh, mm -hmm. and like I do this place. Um, my greatest honor, really, though, I will tell you, is 
is around the opportunity to spend 28 years as a member of the Michigan family uh, and to pursue things uh, about which I am the most passionate, namely education and justice. As a first generation college student, I, I know, as Royster said earlier, I know well the value of education and changing one's life trajectory. Uh, working for a U.S. Senator, I dreamt of a future in public service uh, through which I could help provide education to uh, educational opportunity for many others. But you know, I found my greatest joy in the direct involvement that I've had at Michigan supporting the efforts of a university that is perfectly suited to expand the pathway to knowledge for the benefit of all of society. Uh, President Kennedy used to say, the tide raises all the boats in the harbor. And from my perspective, education is that tide by which we can all have assurance of life, liberty, and the successful pursuit of happiness. However, over time, I've come to understand that our systems, our structures, our institutions were not perfectly designed to provide equal opportunities for everyone. Uh, sadly, we're still living with some systems that actually were perfectly designed to do the opposite, to keep certain segments of society from realizing the kinds of dreams that we all share. So there's more work, more justice work that needs to be done. So you might ask me, why am I retiring at this point when there's so much left to do? Uh, well, first of all, I'm not retiring from pursuit of these passions, just from the position from which I do it. <laughs> and second, and this is really important, I am thrilled to be handing over this work to a person who is even better suited than I am to tackle this important work. I will tell you that you are going to admire and respect Corey Pauling. In her, you will find a partner to continue pursuing the university's most important work, and especially in engaging alumni as a part of those efforts. I only ask you to accept her and love her the way that you have accepted and loved me. And finally, uh, let me state again what I'm convinced is true. If it can't be accomplished at Michigan, then it probably can't be accomplished. <laughs> The only question for those of us in this room is, are we committed to accomplishing the right things? I believe so, I hope so. And I look forward, even in a different way, to working with you to see that happen. Thank you so much for today, for all that you've meant to me in my life, and go blue. Thank you. <laughs> I would now like to call on Vice President Baird for a supplemental agenda item. Thank you, President Coleman. I'm delighted to introduce a special request to honor one of Michigan football's legendary coaches and a wonderful university and community leader. We are, we are asking the Board of Regents to name the tunnel at Michigan Stadium in honor of Coach Lloyd Carr. My colleague, Ward Manuel, the Donald R. Shepard Director of Athletics, will offer more details about this request. Ward? Um, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, this is a s even more special day uh, for me uh, to see my friend Steve uh, retire after 28 years and two people who without them and their work, I would not be here. Hmm. Two people who set me straight when I was on the wrong path in my time as an undergrad, a grad student, and a professional. Two people who encouraged me to keep moving, keep growing, keep learning. So this is, y'all have made my day. Um, <laughs> I'm honored to, to uh, be before you today to ask for your approval to name the Michigan Stadium Tunnel in honor of Hall, our Hall of Fame and National Championship head football coach, Lloyd Carr. Lloyd was one of the great coaches and leaders in our history and in college football. There's so many accolades that I can say about Lloyd, but I don't want to take up the entire meeting. So I'll just highlight a few. He compiled a 20, 122 and 40 record during his 13 years as head coach and led the football team to six 10-win seasons. 
Lloyd guided Michigan to the 1997 National Championship, the school's first title in 50 years, and five Big Ten Conference titles. In recognition of his team's success, he was named the National Coach of the Year in 1997 and 2007. More important to Lloyd was his play to, to Lloyd was his players and their development. He was a teacher as much as he was a football coach, always looking to make a positive impact on the lives of his players. What coach has a dictionary in the hallway outside of their office and encourage players to write down a new word and definition before they entered his office to talk? That was our coach, Lloyd Carr. Sometimes he made me do it because he would forget that I was just a, just graduated or something and walked in the office. <laughs> On the field and in the classroom, his players achieved at a high level. Five won major national awards, including the only defensive player to win the Heisman Trophy. He had 27 first-team All-Americans and 76 All-Big Ten first-team performers. 61 of his players were selected in the NFL draft, including 10 first round selections. And 124 of his players were academic all Big Ten honorees. There was more to Lloyd than what he accomplished on the football field. His legacy of excellence continued through his involvement with the university community. He and his late wife, Lori, championed many fundraising initiatives, including serving as the co-chairs of the campaign to build a new C.S. Mott Children's Hospital and Von Voigtlander Women's Hospital. They endowed a women's athletic scholarship that is presented annually to one of our female student athletes. Lloyd initiated the Women's Football Academy, of which my wife, Chrislyn, participated in one year, and U of M's men's fantasy football experience, which donated all proceeds to the University of Michigan's Comprehensive Can uh, Cancer Center. He is an unwavering supporter of the Chad Tuff Foundation in memory of his grandson. I could think of no greater honor for Coach Carr and the University of Michigan than to recognize his impact and legacy by naming the tunnel at Michigan Stadium after our championship winning coach, our leader, and our friend. Thank you. Thank you. So, is there a motion to approve? And a second? All in favor? Aye. All right. Okay. Uh, I, we, we have a comment, and I think Coach Carr would like to make a comment as well. Oh, oh absolutely. Regent Bernstein, why don't you go first, and then right. we'll ask Coach I, Carr. I, I will be very brief. I am. Um, I, um, you know, there's something that is so appropriate about naming a tunnel after you, um, you know, because when you go through a tunnel, in particular, the tunnel at the football stadium, with the big house, you kind of go through this space and then you emerge into this kind of majestic, um, transformative place. And that's what you've done for a countless number of student athletes and students on this campus. And I recall um, a question that a, co a student, a football player asked once of one of our coaches, it may have been you. It may have been Coach Harbo, and they asked, what, they asked him, what kind of team are we going to have this year? And the answer I think you gave was, we're not going to know what kind of team this is for 30 years until we know what kind of husbands and parents and community leaders and alums and teachers and this team is created. And I thought that was one of the most spectacular, beautiful answers I've ever heard um, from a coach. And um, I, I'm just so so honored to be able to vote on this and to honor you this way so congratulations thank you coach carr the floor is yours i want to thank the regents and uh, ward manuel i coached ward when he was a freshman at michigan hey. and that was um that was one of my wild days so I'm really happy that I've overcome the first impression I he had from him. I want to thank my family. I'd like to introduce my 
daughters, Melissa, Emily, my daughter-in-law, Tammy Carr, and my son, Jason Carr. In my mind, the tunnel to Michigan Stadium is hallowed ground. 95 years ago, 1927, Michigan Stadium was completed. And for the last 95 years, hundreds and maybe thousands of players have run down that tunnel to try to win for Michigan. Think about the bands, the number of people in those bands over the years that have played with their music and their discipline and inspired us and our teams. The cheerleaders, the presidents, the presidents of the United States, one of whom was Gerald R. Ford. The hockey team, the graduation days where those students who were graduating and leaving to make this a better world. I'm sure most of, are there any regents here who have not been down that tunnel? I invite you <laughs> to go. You have to go there at least <laughs> once. But mm -hmm. I want to thank just some special people. I know we're in a hurry. Coach Jim Beckler, Coach Moeller hired me and uh, inspired me and taught me things that I needed to do to be a better coach. I worked for two great presidents. One of my favorite people in this world is Lee Bollinger. He was the president when I was um, in my interim years as a interim year as a head coach, and um, he was unbelievable. Uh, and he inspired me. He taught me. I learned from him, and I loved him. And of course, Mary Sue Coleman, what a great F supporter of athletics, but most importantly of athletes. And uh, she was tough. I, w I will witness that. <laughs> As is Royster. <laughs> but um, I worked for three athletic directors. Joe Roberson hired me. Tom Goss and Bill Martin, all were good men. In all those years, I never had a bad exchange with any of them. And uh, they did what they could do to help us. So, but most of all, I want to thank my players. I'm here because of them, of what they did, of what the, how they competed. <laughs> how they played, and how they responded to adversity a few times when uh, things didn't go our way. So the only regret I have is that Chad Carr, Lori Carr, are not here today. Thanks. Go Blue. Thank you. <laughs> You're too kind. You're too kind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Coach Carr. This is my final board meeting as president. And the way this meeting has started is the perfect example of what I love about the University of Michigan. When we face challenges, we seek solutions. We always focus on tomorrow. And we celebrate the people who make the university such a special place for our students, faculty, staff, and alumni. It's been an honor to be able to step in during a difficult time for the university. I want to thank the members of the board for your confidence in me. 
I also owe a debt of gratitude to the executive officers at this table for their support and counsel. They are the best in higher education. I feel very good knowing that Dr. Ono will have such a dedicated governing board and talented leadership team when he begins on October 14th. I also want to thank my husband, Ken, who is here with us today. Ken, please stand up so people can thank you. He won't, but he's there. Uh, I couldn't do the work without him. I couldn't have done it before. I couldn't have done it this time. Michigan will always be special to us, and we're profoundly grateful for the experiences and opportunities that you have given us. So thank you, and forever, go blue. So now we have to get on to the regular meeting of the regular business of the board. Our first presentation, we are pleased to welcome Paul Robinson, the Associate Vice Provost for Enrollment Management and University Registrar for an update on admissions. So Paul. Thank you, President Coleman. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to share news regarding the undergraduate class and overall enrollment at the University of Michigan. I bring greetings from Vice Provost Adele Brumfield, who is traveling on behalf of the university and is disappointed that she could not be here with you today, but she sends her greetings. And so today, many of the data points in this presentation are preliminary. Final data, which we don't expect will fluctuate much, will be available in the next few weeks. So U of M remains a top destination for students. Um, there are many factors that make the University of Michigan a top destination and choice for our incoming students, including our strong academic and research prowess, our commitment to affordability, and the access that our diverse student community has to our renowned faculty and our other resources. Here's just some trends on application growth. So for the 2022 recruitment cycle, we saw a record number of applications, totaling nearly 90,000. There was a 6% increase in first year applications and a 14% increase in transfer applications compared to the previous year. And as a reminder, we practice holistic admissions review. So every file is reviewed multiple times. A little bit of dizzying yield data, but since 2020, we have seen our first year yield increase, which really means that more students are saying yes to Michigan. Our transfer yield remains somewhat flat at the in-state level, and we decline just ever so slightly at the out-state level. I'm going rather quickly in the interest of time here. Uh, we welcomed over 8,300 new first year and transfer students to the Ann Arbor campus this fall. These students are motivated, hardworking, and maintained all the academic rigor expected of Michigan students. And we continue to see increases in key demographic groups with a 33% growth in first generation students, resulting in over 300 more students and 30% growth in Hispanic Latinx students, resulting in over 200 more students as compared to our previous year. And nearly 4,200 incoming students hail from our great state of Michigan and coming from 78 of our 83 counties and 71 students are from our beautiful Upper Peninsula. Collectively, our undergraduate student population has representation from all 83 Michigan counties. Our out-of-state incoming students come from all 50 states, the District of Columbia, two territories, and around the globe from 68 countries. While again, these numbers are preliminary, our fall enrollment will exceed 51,000, which will be a record at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. And our campus is gonna be comprised of approximately 52% female and 48% male. Regarding uh, the commitment to the, our commitment to affordability, the university's continued commitment to making education accessible and affordable has equated to annual increases in our financial aid budget, which has contributed to our enrollment growth and our excellent student body. Through initiatives like the Go Blue Guarantee, the university's financial support is positively impacting students and families. And finally, I just wanna thank you for welcoming me today to share this preliminary information on our fall 22 enrollment. I'm pleased to share that the University of Michigan continues our tradition of being a leader in higher education and our future is bright. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Tremendous report. We're really tremendous work by the admissions office. Uh, 
We now have a committee report from Finance, Audit, and Investment and the Regent Hubbard. Thank you. The FAI committee, including co-chair Regent Weiser and members White and Brown, met to get an update on the capital excellence overview and also to review an investment policy statement. Thank you. Regent Bernstein, the Health Affairs Committee. Uh, Coleman, you know, I would I would say that the entire board has been engaged in in, in the work that I'm about to um, uh, touch on. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, share that the Mich that Michigan Medicine and the University of Michigan Professional Nurses Council (MMA) have re reached a tentative agreement on a new contract. The completion of these negotiations represents many hundreds, maybe thousands, of hours by our bargaining teams addressing complex issues, and we are very grateful for their efforts. This work results in continued support of and focus on our patients. This mediated resolution covers all major issues brought forward by the nursing union, including those around staffing, scheduling, and compensation. We also want to thank all of our University of Michigan health leaders, faculty, and staff for working together during the past weeks on a complex planning process to continue care for patients if a work stoppage had occurred. We recognize your daily commitment to ensuring that our patients are receiving the highest quality care during these extremely challenging times. The ultimate goal is for Michigan Medicine to continue to be a destination workplace for nurses and all staff, faculty, and learners, and a destination healthcare system for patients and the community. Thank you. We're now moving to the consent agenda. Minutes and reports are on the website. Our reports will begin with Executive Vice President Rungi. Thank you, President Coleman. Uh, as you know, <clears throat> um, as we just heard, the uh, Michigan Medicine working through with mediators uh, has reached a uh, contract with the Michigan Professional Nurses Council and m and uh, we very much look forward to continuing our work together. Uh, throughout the summer, our teams have worked and continued their outstanding quality and safety work. And I'd like to mention three noteworthy assessments that reflect the extraordinary contributions of the Michigan Medicine team. Uh, the Joint Commission, uh, which accredits uh, hospitals, uh, made one of their uh, unscheduled visits, which uh, they do every three years, uh, to survey us on Friday, August 12th. And after a comprehensive one-week on-site visit of various units and clinics, for the first time in many years, uh, UM Health received no CMS conditional level findings, which means that none of the findings required the Joint Commission to return in 45 days. Now, this is truly exceptional, very unusual, and as noted by the surveyors, the absence of conditional level findings highlights the expertise and commitment of all of our teams and the outstanding quality and safety of care provided at UM Health. Forbes uh, named University of Michigan Health the top health system in Michigan and one of the state's top employers. This recognition was created through a survey of 70,000 U.S. employees across 25 industry sectors. The survey considered every aspect of an employee's experience, such as working conditions, salary, potential for growth, and diversity. And finally, U.S. News. Uh, in July, the University of Michigan's health Health adult hospitals were ranked best in Michigan and 17th in the nation by U.S. News and World Report in their best hospitals ratings for 2022 and 2023. This also is a prestigious honor measuring excellence in patient care. U.S. Health, uh, UM Health was also given the U.S. News and World Report honor roll distinction for the seventh consecutive year. This makes the organization one of only a few U.S. hospitals and the only one in Michigan that delivers repeatedly this highest level and recognized level of care across a large group of specialties. C.S. Mott Children's Hospital is named the top children's hospital in the state also by U.S. News and World Report. So in closing, these recent findings highlight why Michigan Medicine is one of only eight hospitals in the nation to be honored by LeapFrog for 10 consecutive years, U.S. News Honor Roll, and CMS five-star quality ratings. This is due to the unrelenting focus on quality by all of our teams and uh, to the benefit of all of our patients. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice President Harmon. Thank you, President. <clears throat> Thank you, President Coleman. I'm not sure if this is on. There we go. Thank you, President Coleman. The first month of the new academic year is going very well. We saw an amazing turnout and enthusiasm from students throughout all of our move-in 
and Welcome to Michigan activities created in partnership with the Office of New Student Programs. We're also looking forward to welcoming many parents, families, and loved ones to campus for the incredibly popular Parents and Family Weekend, which starts tomorrow and goes through Sunday. Throughout Move In, Welcome, and other fall 22, 2022 events, I've witnessed excitement from our students and their parents and family members. Last but not least, I wanna take this opportunity to thank President Coleman for the great work she has done to lead our university. President Coleman, it's been truly an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Chancellor Grasso. Thank you, President Coleman. <clears throat> the semester is off to a great start. We uh, have had a great kickoff to the semester, literally and figuratively, because we had our campus picnic with our first ever kickball game. And the IT team, in the spirit of global politics, threatened to cut off all service if they didn't win. And they won, <laughs> of course. Um, our alumni awards ceremony uh, scheduled, is scheduled for tomorrow as part of homecoming week festivities. Dearborn Mayor Abdullah Hamoud will receive our Distinguished Alumnus of the Year Award. He was a, a Dearborn graduate and two-time Ann Arbor graduate and the first Arab American Mayor of Dearborn. He and I are also co-hosting our first town gown bike ride next week, and you're all invited to join. We will be biking through campus and into West Dearborn on a 10K route. Um, I'm also hosting the second uh, Chancellor's Book Club on October 5th, and we're going to be discussing the book When We Cease to Understand the World by ben Benjamin uh, Labatut. It, uh, New York Times uh, uh, listed it as one of the 10 bo best books of 2021, and there's still plenty of time for you to read it. It's a short book, and join on October 5th. Um, with regards to enrollment, we saw an, an increase of 1% in total new students this year on the Dearborn campus. But more importantly, we've experienced a 3% increase in our four-year graduation rate and a 3% a 4% increase in our three-year transfer student graduation rate. So that is very important. Um, and we've also welcomed 374 new Go Blue Guarantee scholars to the campus with this incoming class. As uh, uh, Marshall Rungi pointed out, U.S. News and World Report rankings just came out, and we were ranked, the University of Michigan Dearborn was ranked the top regional public university in the state and number 30th overall in the Midwest. We were also named the number one regional public university in the state for veterans and for social mobility. With this being President Coleman's last meeting, I would like to thank her for her support of the Dearborn campus. While we have not worked together for a long period of time, I've come to appreciate and understand with deep affection and respect your remarkable talents as a leader and stalwart steward of this great university. I wish you the best of luck at your st second stab at retirement. Go Blue. <laughs> Chancellor Dutta. <laughs> Thank you, President Coleman. Um, so from Flint, good news can be shared more than once. Uh, it is mm -hmm. important. Our new student enrollment this fall increased by 8%. Uh, this represents a 6% increase in our first year students, first time in five years, a 10% increase in our undergraduate transfer students, first such increase in 11 years, and a 6% increase in new graduate student enrollment. So I'd like to thank incredibly good team in undergraduate and graduate admissions office, as well as in the financial aid office. Uh, first year retention also increased this year. However, let me point out that the 2021 cohort of Promise Scholars students who come from all over the state, they recorded a 83% retention fall to fall, the highest mark during the past 15 years. And it is actually higher than the regular FITIAC retention rate. So we are energized and building on this momentum. Round campus, uh, the higher learning 
HLC Higher Learning Commission has improved the School of Management's Doctorate of Business Administration program. This is the first fully accredited DBA program in the state of Michigan. Our School of Nursing is one of only 50 schools across the country selected by American Association of Colleges of Nursing to participate in a national initiative designed to build a diverse nursing workforce. Fiscal year 2022, overall donor reacquisition and retention increased by 9 and 11%. I thank Tom Baird and his team for helping us and our collaboration with his team. Empowering My Success is a very important program that supports college students who have experienced foster care. Our U of M Flint team received a renewal of over half a million from the, from the state's Department of Health and Human Services. We received the highest evaluation score and the largest dollar amount amongst the six Massey schools that received the award. Physical therapy program, which was launched on the Ann Arbor campus before transitioning to Flint in 1983, is celebrating its 60th anniversary with a re reunion on Saturday in Ann Arbor. In closing, when I need historical context for Flint and U of M Flint, I go to Dr. Mary Jo Sakelsky. Born and raised in Flint, and she lives in Flint. She came to U of M Flint in 1983 to do her internship and then became an employee in January of 1984 and remains so. She has done many roles, many leadership roles. She has witnessed in her 40 years the adversities faced by the, our city and our campus. She told me as I was talking about the transition and the transformation that, that President Coleman referred to. 70s were a time of transition for Flint. The citizens were still living a good life, but in the background, warning signs had already appeared. General Motors was starting to lose its grip on the automobile industry. 80s would find higher education in uncharted territory. 25 years after its founding, U of M Flint was in financial distress. James Murdoch, Flint's Vice Chancellor for Budget and Finance at that time, cited uncertainties about Flint's U of, U of M Flint's state appropriation and unavoidable cost increases. And he announced a tuition increase in fall of 81 of 18%. <clears throat> So U of M Flint has faced a lot of adversities. In the same way that the city of Flint has been reshaping its identity for the past 40 years, we, the University of Michigan Flint, have to proactively shape our future. We owe it to our students, faculty, staff, alumni, loyal supporters, and the city of Flint. So in closing, I thank you, President Coleman, and I thank the board for your confidence in and the collective support of the work that we are about ready to embark. Paraphrasing a famous quote, the work ahead will seem impossible, but only until it is done. Thank you, President Coleman. Thank you. We now call on the CSG President, Noah Zimmerman. Noah. Good afternoon, President Coleman, members of the board and executive officers. My name is Noah Zimmerman and I serve as the student body president. With my student body vice president, Jacqueline Hillman, we're pleased and honored to speak to you all on matters relating to central student government and the Ann Arbor student body at large. As we return to campus, we must remember the importance of service to students. This necessitates transparency and effective communication with the Michigan community. We asked the board and university administration to employ direct outreach with students outside the standard medium of emails and engage in direct grassroots dialogue with student groups and individuals to better foster a student-centered campus environment. On CSG's current and upcoming campus programming, our game day hydration stations aim to provide water bottles on high-risk days 
to help foster student safety, specifically in areas frequented by tailgaters. So far, these efforts have been a resounding success, and we look forward to continuing to provide this service to the student body. In collaboration with Student Life and the Dean of Students, CSG is currently developing multiple well-being initiatives to promote healthy habits and activities for students as we transition back into a fully in-person semester. On our notifications to the board, CSG has finalized our budget for the fall semester. One of our administration's main goals is to increase transparency by CSG to the students and regents why and how we spend the money generated by student fees. We also want to mention and share our immense gratitude to the board for approving CSG's fee increase. Because of the fee increase, CSG has been able to compensate front desk employees $15 an hour while maintaining robust levels of student organization funding and increasing CSG programming capacity, contributing to a richer student-led campus environment. This has enabled us to ensure that CSG is able to provide a plethora of opportunities and services to the student body. If you ever want to discuss student programming or need thoughts from a student perspective, please do not hesitate to reach out. We would always be happy and enthusiastic to share what students feel on topics to ensure student engagement with the regents and administration. We look forward to working with you to advocate for the needs of students and sincerely thank you for your continued cooperation. We also want to extend our deep gratitude to President Coleman. Thank you for your service, leadership, and collaboration with students over the past few years. Thank you very much, and please reach out and go blue. Thanks, Noah. The personnel actions are in the materials. Retirement memoirs are in the materials. We have one memorial also in the materials. Degrees are in the materials. I now call for a vote on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Second. All in favor? And opposed? Thank you. Passes. We now go to the regular agenda and finance and property. The first two items are for information only. We'll go to the medical science unit one. B and D wings of EVP Chattis. The, I'm, I'm sorry, we have to vote on these individually. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The second is the Environmental and Water Resources Engineering Building in George Gran Granger Brown Memorial Laboratory Civil and Environmental Engineering Project, EVP Chattis. Again, nothing to add, Madam President. Is there a motion? Move Support? Support? All in favor? Thank you. University of Michigan, <clears throat> University of Michigan Health, University Hospital, pneumatic tube expansion, EVP Chattis. Nothing to add, Madam President. All in favor? The Center for Academic Innovation, EVP Chattis. Nothing to add, Madam President. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, and now we go, oh, okay, right. And now we go to the uh, supplemental. Oh, are we doing that? Yes, we are. Yes. Uh, EVP Chattis, yep. I, I, sorry, sub, Working Capital Investment Policy. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Madam President. The Working Capital Investment Policy Statement, IPS, grants the Treasurer day-to-day -day investment authority over the university's short and intermediate-term working capital with direct oversight provided by the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer and the Associate Vice President for Finance. This Working Capital Investment Policy Statement clearly identifies associated investment objectives, ensures adequate operating liquidity in all economic cycles, further diversifies the university's investment portfolio, provides additional transparency and focus around short-term investment objectives, and eliminates the natural conflict between long and short intermediate time horizons, and I recommend this action for approval. Support? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, items 7 through 22 are conflict of interest items, each of which requires six votes for approval, does anyone have any questions about a particular item? Would any regents like to request recusal from voting on any items? I now call for a vote on items 7 through 22. Is there a motion to approve? And second. All in favor? And you have to do a show of hands. Thank you. All have approved. Okay, uh, the next item is Vice President Churchill, uh, the revision of Regents bylaws. Is there a motion to approve and support? All in favor? Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, I think now we turn it over to uh, Vice President Churchill for public comments. Yes, each speaker has up to two minutes to address the board at the mic. I'll call you in order. Our first speaker is Karthik Pasupala. Hi, my name is Karthik Pasupala, and I'm a third year undergraduate student double majoring in PPE, which stands for philosophy, politics, and economics, and economics. Um, I'm also in the central student government and involved with a variety of student groups on campus. I'm here to talk about student life. I'm going to specifically talk about specific initiatives that the university of administration should enact that would positively benefit students. One such initiative would be a swipe it forward meal program, which would address one of the most prevalent issues among the student body at the university, which is food insecurity. When CSG conducted a survey last year, 446 respondents reported that they cut the size of their meals and or skipped meals because they didn't have the money to purchase food. When we go to one of the wealthiest public universities in the world by endowment, it's absolutely imperative that the university acts to support those who come from less privileged backgrounds. This can be done by instituting a program that has been implemented in many other universities across the country, including NYU, fellow Big Ten schools, University of Minnesota, the University of Iowa, other universities including UCLA, the University of Vermont, and more. Many students don't use all their meals in the semester, and even if they do, they're very likely to donate some meal plans for students who are food insecure or lack a meal plan. I would strongly encourage the university administration, specifically the Office of Student Life and M Dining, to work with interested student bodies on campus, such as central student government, to create and implement such a program on campus. Another key issue for the vast majority of students at the university is tuition. If the administration is truly committed to affordability, then it's crucial that the Board of Regents strongly consider and implement a tuition freeze as soon as possible. Higher education is getting more and more unaffordable for students across the country. And the pandemic's financial toll on students shouldn't be understated. This causes students' mental health declines, particularly low-income students, and by, necess by necessity, they are forced to work numerous jobs to meet basic needs, such as paying utilities, purchasing food, and paying tuition. I strongly encourage the Board of Regents to consider these initiatives to greatly improve student life. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah Heinrich. Mr. Ryan will distribute. Yeah, thanks. You can get started. Okay. Thanks. I am Deb Heinrich, mother of Michael Heinrich. On April 16th, 2017, two weeks before Michael was to graduate from the University of Michigan, a rotted University of Michigan tree fell on Michael while riding his motorcycle, crushing his neck, rendering him a complete C6, C7 quadriplegic. To President Coleman, to the Regents, to Timothy Lynch, and to Keith Brooks. You chose to fight Michael all the way to the Michigan Supreme Court so that you would not have to assist Michael with health care, tuition, or life. You chose to fight Michael based on Michigan governmental immunity, noting that your forester said they were neglectful in not removing a rotted tree with large plates of fungus surrounding the tree two and a half years before it fell on Michael. You chose to fight Michael a quadriplegic. Michael is an amazing young man, a leader and best. Before your tree fell on him, he was the captain of the University of Michigan Engineering Human Powered Submarine Team, taking the team to England and Washington, D.C. to compete with teams from around the world. He is now in the University of Michigan Masters of Transportation Engineering and the Masters of Urban and Regional Planning Program, thanks to receiving a national scholarship from the Craig Nielsen Foundation. He is more than a survivor. He is and always has been an inspiration and hero. I am disappointed and disheartened in you with the choices and decisions you have made to fight Michael and to represent the University of Michigan. I am asking you and President-elect Ono to do what I've taught my children, to take responsibility, have accountability, to do what is right, to do what President Coleman stated in a previous Regents meeting, to own your mistakes. I'm asking you, representing the University of Michigan, to take care of Michael's health care and life needs. To the public, please share Michael's story. Please share and follow how the University of Michigan has answered the questions I've asked today. Thank you. To President Coleman, Timothy to President Coleman, 
President-elect Ono, the Regents, and Timothy Lynch, is this the University of Michigan? Timothy Heinrich? President Coleman, Regents, and President-elect Ono, I'm speaking to you today as the father of Michael Heinrich. My wife shared with you the University of Michigan has admitted in court you were negligent in the matter of a tree crushing my son's neck. My son did not have to sustain the injury that resulted in him being a quadriplegic. I want to make it clear, the University of Michigan admitted in court they were negligent, but the previous president and your attorneys hid behind Michigan's governmental immunity. If this happened to your child, would you expect the University of Michigan to accept the responsibility and not hide behind governmental immunity? Should the Uni University of Michigan tell every parent, student, prospective student, if you're injured on the University of Michigan's campus due to the university's negligence, U of M won't help and will hide behind governmental immunity like you have done to my son. As a parent, as a parent, look me in the eyes. Tell me that the way the University of Michigan has treated my son is morally right. Tell me that the university is morally right right now by not helping him, knowing you were negligent. Whether a thousand students are harmed or one student is harmed, will the University of Michigan do what is right and follow a moral compass? Helping Michael will not take away resources from other students. The University of Michigan has over $400 million in its insurance company, the Veritas Insurance Corporation, that addresses issues such as Michael's. You ask your students to be the leaders and the best and have integrity. Should not the same be asked and expected of the regents and the president? You, you are the university's president. You are the university's, University of Michigan's regents. You have the authority to set the moral compass and do what is right. I ask you to do what is right. I ask you to take care of Michael's medical needs <laughs> and life needs. You do not, do not hide behind Michigan's governmental immunity. Show the students, parents and community, and my son, your moral compass is set correctly, and you actually believe in justice. Thank you. Renee Curtis. Renee Curtis. I'm Renee Curtis, the president of University of Michigan Professional Nurse Council. As you know, our union reached a tentative agreement last night, almost at midnight. I'm here on behalf of 6,200 members to thank everyone who has supported and advocated for us over the last six months. I'm very proud of our nurses, and I'm proud and grateful for all the community supporters, especially the labor community. I also want to thank you, all the regents, for your engagement in this process. Regent Brown, Regent Illich. I would like to personally thank you for your efforts and leadership around this situation. Regents, your willingness to engage in meaningful dialogue are, around our work conditions is much appreciated. Dr. Rungi, listening to our concerns is important, and thank you for that engagement, and I look forward to further collaboration. It is our sincere hope patient safety and patient outcomes guide Michigan Medicine's future decision making. We know that we all care about providing the best patient care possible and making Michigan Medicine the brightest and best, where all nurses want to work and thrive. Investing in nurses is investing in patient care, for our work conditions are our patient care conditions. We have much work yet still to do as our emergency department remains in crisis and needs your direct attention and other areas are still experiencing unsustainable short staffing solutions. Nurses have stood strong both at the beginning at the bargaining table and in public spaces to put our patients first and stand up together for what we as nurses need. Our nurses have been unwavering in our commitment to advocate for the end of dangerous mandatory overtime, a new mechanism to enforce workload ratios, a key in the health and safety of both nurses and patients, a competitive wages so we can retain and attract nurses and end this staffing crisis here at Michigan Medicine. I am proud to say that this new tentative agreement achieves each of those goals. Along the way, we hope we'll have shed some light on the values of nurses here at U of M and the incredible cha challenges we face in doing our jobs. 
our patients will come continue to come first and we will continue to stand up for what is right and necessary as we move forward. Thank you. Re Regent Brown. are always here to thank you. All University of Michigan team members are equally important, but we consider you the first among, e among equals. And I can tell you every member of the board uh, followed this and worked for this uh, from the very first day. Um, but I would like to say, I know we're going into unprecedented difficult times for the health system um, and we'll be lucky and we'll need your help in getting through those. So thank you. Thank you, Regent Brown. Zina Nasari, Nasiri? Is Zena here? All right, Ira, Anjali, Anwar. Is Ira here? Okay. Andrew Thompson. Hello, Regents, uh, President, Chancellors, Provosts, and Student Government. My name is Andy T. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I'm a lecturer in the Stamp School of Art and Design on the Ann Arbor campus. I'm here to speak on behalf of the One University Coalition to advocate for more funding and resources for the liberal arts and sciences on the U of M Flint and Dearborn campuses. One U believes in parity, equity, and transparency of funding across all three of U of M's campuses. And we believe that what is best for the students of Dearborn and Flint is also what's best for the campuses and for our state. As a vast majority of the Flint and Dearborn students are Michigan residents and stay in state after graduation. When students have less classes or programs of study to choose from, that hurts their overall education and it hurts our schools. When classes and programs get consolidated or cut, that impacts our enrollment and retention rates. That then gets used as an argument to make further cuts and it becomes a vicious feedback loop a catch-22 for which the university administration and regents refuse to take any corrective action. It is exciting to hear that there will be a transformational town hall uh, meeting tomorrow on the Flint campus with a potential announcement of $100 million of new funding for expanding programming and career preparation. But while you're pursuing this new programming, you are actively harming existing programs through budget cuts. I know that for the past year, the cadaver lab in the U of M Flint uh, has cut staffing such that biology students pre-med and medical students haven't had full access to this vital learning tool outside of class time like they used to. Students see what's going on and are angry that resources are being restricted from them. This does not help with retention and enrollment. More wealthy students at the Ann Arbor campus will have the full range of disciplines that allow students to, have, uh, to learn and grow professionally and personally while the regional campus will offer career training. One U says no more cuts to the liberal arts and sciences. Students deserve more. We ask you to do the right thing, and we know you can afford it. Thank you. Ken Whitaker. Is Ken Whitaker here? OK. Ebony Taylor. President Coleman and board regents. Um, my name is Ebony Taylor and I'm the Michigan Executive Director of Mothering Justice Action Fund. I am a University of Michigan graduate, um, undergrad 08 and uh, got my MPP from the Ford School in 13. At Mothering Justice Action Fund, we organize mothers of color around issues that they are disproportionately impacted by, whether it be rep reproductive rights, access to quality and affordable childcare or paid sick leave. A common theme to our policy agenda or our mama's agenda is voting rights. We know that U of M shares many of these same goals, both within U of M, but also instilling these values in students uh, as they go on to careers here in Michigan and outside of the state. Mothering Justice is proud to be a founding member of the Defend Black Voters Coalition, which was formed to fight the voter suppression efforts designed to make it disproportionately harder for black and working class people to vote. Ironically, Blue Cross and Delta Dental have issued um, strong racial justice statements and the, Blue and the Blue Cross CEO signed a joint statement against the very voter suppression bills 
that were then compiled into the Secure My Vote voter suppression initiative. Defending black lives and investing in our communities means doing more than issuing a generic statement or changing social media pages to a black square. Blue Cross is the single largest corporate contributor to the legislators pushing Jim Crow style voter suppression here in Michigan. The U of M regents have an opportunity to take a principled stand for Michigan's democracy. If our elected officials don't take action, black, brown, and working class people will be left to fend for themselves, ourselves, uh, while university dollars fund the, fund the attack on voting rights. We hope the Board of Regents will ultimately choose to move companies like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan to align their political spending with the values of our university and the need to, de to defend democracy and civil rights in Michigan. Thank you. Jeffrey Harold. Yes. Good afternoon, Regents, President Coleman. My name is Jeff Harrell. I'm the pastor of New Beginners Community Church of Washtenaw County. I'm an alumna of LSA class of 78, recently retired after 30 years of service to U of M in the Student Academic Affairs of Literature, Science, and Arts, where I was coordinator of academic standards and special populations. I'm a former member of the University of Michigan Diversity Council. My faith work also leads me to work on racial and social justice issues including with such organizations that I'm a part of, Moses Action and the Washington Regional Organizing Coalition. One of our core goals is to promote increased voter participation among people of color, low-income individuals, and other historically marginalized groups. The core goal is what led us to be a founding member of the coalition called Defend Black Voters. In 2020, black, brown, and working class people across the country showed up to the polls in force, and now we're facing the reaction a thinly veiled ploy to make it harder for us to vote. That ploy is called Secure My Vote. This effort could be passed into law by the end of the year, and the stakes couldn't be higher. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and Delta Dental of Michigan have been using taxpayer intuition dollars through their contracts with the University of Michigan to bankroll the legislators behind this effort. Vendors doing business with the university should align their own publicly stated positions on racial justice and internal policies on diversity, equity, inclusion with their political advocacy and spending. 20 years ago, as the then president of University of Michigan um, Association of Professional um, Administrators, faculty and staff, I stood before the Board of Regents to mm -hmm. encourage them in their historic defense of affirmative action before the Supreme Court. At this critical moment, Silas is complicity, and we're asking the Board of Regents to take a bold stand as an important voice in our community to use the resources and influences that you have available to help hold these corporations accountable to protect our civil rights. If the U of M isn't prepared to use this voice, what message are you sending to your students in our community? Thank you for the opportunity U of M provides for voices from the community to be heard on matters important to us and the leadership of the University of Michigan. Thank you. Regent Bernstein. Uh, about voter suppression and other threats to democracy. These are indeed urgent and important issues. It made me think about this book, What Universities Owe Democracy. Uh, written by Johns Hopkins President Ron Daniels, who participated in a retreat with us. I can't remember which one it was, but it was recently actually, in which he writes, and I'm going to quote, our colleges and universities are indispensable to liberal democracy. Colleges and universities are among liberal democracy's cornerstone institutions, and they play an indispensable role in the exercise of building, maintaining, and inspiring democracy. This immense potential has been brought into clearest relief during America's most convulsive moments. When the democratic project felt most imperiled, the nation turned to its universities to enter the breach. Tragically, that is where we are right now. The descent into autocracy is driven by three interrelated forces, and all three are taking place right now. 
First, a cult of personality around a charismatic figure. Second, an embrace of or indifference toward political violence. And three, the suppression of and interference in the democratic process. With regard to the third development, voting, in 1835, Tocqueville observed in Democracy in America that democracy is either expanding or shrinking. That is why it would be an institutional failure to not marshal the resources of this great university in the fight to preserve and expand upon our democracy. The question is, how do we do this in the most impactful and responsible way? I believe that we must do so in ways that embrace our unique role in our democracy through our education and research missions, and by enabling our students, faculty, and staff to participate fully in the democratic process. At the same time, we cannot interfere in the political affairs of others. We don't do that with our students, our faculty, our administrators, or our staff, nor should we do so with our vendors. Under the Michigan Constitution, our state legislature is a separate co-equal branch of government, and this distinction must be respected. Again, from President Daniel's book, after World War II, with the nation reeling from democracy's near demise at the hands of fascism, President Truman turned to the nation's universities, convening a national commission on democracy and higher education that declared and I quote, the first and most essential charge upon higher education is that at all levels and in all fields of specialization, it shall be the carrier of democratic values, ideals, and processes. Today, we stand at another such point of vulnerability. Our institutions of higher education can be neither indifferent nor passive in the face of democratic backsliding. At this moment, the University of Michigan cannot be indifferent or passive. We must be and are deeply engaged in our role as one of the essential stakeholders of the liberal democratic experience, experiment. Finally, on a personal level, I encourage everyone at U of M to work like our democracy depends on it, because it does. I urge you, one, to vote. Vote for whomever you believe expands and grows democracy. Two, sign up to do voter protection work. And three, support candidates of any party who are committed to protecting and expanding democracy. By doing so, you are doing an important service to democracy and the University of Michigan. Uh, to follow up on Regent Bernstein's remarks, uh, with which I agree, and I think most of the board agrees, um, our elections should be about ideas. Uh, the candidate with the best ideas should win the election. Uh, as soon as uh, our state legislature proposed 39 bills about 18 months ago uh, that suppressed the vote. I and other board members here spoke against it. A uh, voting should be easy, not fraught with difficulty. It should not be an obstacle course to find your way to a voting booth. History behind the second Tuesday in November when we've always voted is based on convenience. The harvest was in and our society was able to make it to the voting booths at that time. That was the most convenient time. Many of us on this board are very invested in this issue and have worked in this area for years and years. I worked in the 1996 presidential general election campaign as a young lawyer. I helped, uh, as, as other members on this board, uh, found the Michigan Voter Protection Program in 2004. Uh, I was an officer of the Michigan Association for Justice from 2007 to 2012 when I was president. We worked tirelessly on this issue and still do today. Uh, earlier this week, I filled out a candidate questionnaire uh, with the state's largest newspaper. Uh, one question involved freedom of speech. I focused on voter suppression as an example of limiting our freedom of speech. Voter suppression should have no place in our country, and I think everyone on this board agrees with that issue. Thank you. Um, our last speaker today, oh, I'm sorry. Not beat the dead horse, but, but access to the ballot may be our most important right, and any effort to restrict it is immoral, and I have and will always fight against it, and I applaud your efforts to do the same. Uh, but ultimately, um, this university 
being a public institution of all the citizens of the state, uh, what we do uh, as an institution, not as individuals, uh, matters. And even though we have a majority on this board uh, who thinks, uh, if not all of the members of the board, that think like you do, um, and we could use this institution of the people as a tool to support uh, your efforts, um, I fear that to create that precedence, if the uh, board would ever change, uh, they could use this institution as a weapon uh, to fight against the very things uh, that we are trying to support. And that is why I think it is our role as, as public officials to speak uh, to this issue is very important, but not to use the University of Michigan uh, so uh, blatantly in that effort is, is also appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker today is Kurt Beyer. If Kurt is here. Okay. Well, then um, uh, Pastor Harold may have been our last speaker. <laughs> is that it? Yes. All right. Um, I'd just like to, as chair of the board, on behalf of President Coleman and all of the board, I want to thank all the speakers. I spent many more years out on your side of the fence. I'm nervously sometimes talking, and I know how hard that can be, but I want you to know how much we appreciate it and how important it is. So thank you on behalf of all the board. Um, I have one last, uh, on, a, on a day of uh, saying thanks to many, many great people, uh, we have one more to, to thank, President Coleman. Uh, the board turned to President Coleman at a tremendously difficult time with a tremendously difficult challenge to restore the integrity and confidence in the administration of this university. But in just nine months, she has done just that. With grace, humility, and an unfaltering love for this institution. As I mentioned last night, uh, I think selflessness is the most rare uh, and greatest human virtue. And what you've done for this university in this time uh, is a perfect demonstration of that. I'm telling you, if I'm ever able to retire, there is no way they're dragging me out <laughs> to do a job this hard. But, but uh, President Coleman, under uh, your leadership, uh, our momentum in regards to key initiatives never slowed. Uh, in fact, the university's uh, systemic effort to address sexual misconduct has made significant progress. Uh, President Coleman has increased the urgency of our cultural journey work to ensure that all members of our community feel safe and supported. We look forward to continuing this important effort with Dr. Ono. Uh, one thing we have appreciated most about President Coleman over the last year is her willingness to share her expertise on matters of higher education with us and to do so with kindness. She was an invaluable advisor and counselor as we planned and carried out our national search for our new university president. Her knowledge and experience helped inform our decision making and we couldn't be happier with the end result in Dr. Santa Ono. The president's job is not always easy, as you know. Uh, as the top executive ultimately responsible for the university's success, the president is often called upon to deal with difficult challenges and make hard decisions. Uh, we talked about one of them today in regards to U of M Flint, for example. But President Coleman, you have never shied away from these difficult situations. You've always been solution oriented uh, with an eye on the future, focused wholly on what is best for the University of Michigan. So uh, speaking of decisions, the board has made two easy ones. First of all, Ken and Mary Sue will be the honorary captains at Saturday's game. <laughs> <laughs> And secondly, the Regents will honor Mary Sue with an honorary degree in the spring as a formal oh. gesture of our appreciation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I, really, I really didn't expect that. And so I thank I you. I love surprises. I, you, you surprised me completely. And, uh, thank you. It, I it, think it, some it, other members of the board. Would it's like been a pleasure. I'll, I'll be very quick, Mary Sue. I, I, I know how you feel about uh, the constant uh, <laughs> speeches about you, but I, I want to say, um, you know, when, when we approached you back in January about this, um, I think it literally took three minutes for you to, uh, 
to take this job. The first one was to call Ken yep. the, and tell him you were taking this job. <laughs> and the second two were to back out of the Target parking lot that you were in when we called you. <laughs> and I, I think a lot about that day and uh, the decision this board had to make and, and um, the difficult ones, but the easiest one was asking you to come back. Um, and, you know, I think as a board member, uh, as chair of the board at the time, we owe you a, uh, a debt of gratitude that we'll never be able to repay. Um, this university uh, was, uh, was really indebted to you over the years of service that you're here as the permanent president. Um, but this legacy uh, from the last nine months will live on for decades beyond this. Um, so thank you again for everything you did for me and everything you did for this board and for this institution. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. What can I say after that? Thanks so much. Call the, tails. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> call, call tails. Thank you. Yeah.